let's talk about sound design. So, obviously this all probably looks a bit complicated and all a bit new in Live 10, and we're going to get into that in due course. But first of all, can you give me a show of hands how many people use a wavetable synth? Okay, good. How many people use Serum in this room? Great. How many people use Massive in this room? Great. How many people haven't got a fucking clue how it works? Quite a few. Okay, great. Well, that's not a problem because, you know, obviously these days it makes it a lot simpler with the way workflows are to use these types of synths. So I wanted to kill several birds with one stone here by essentially talking to you about Ableton Live 10, which is not due out until the 6th of February. So this is a beta version. And the beta is actually available to you today if you own Ableton Live 9. So it's a fantastic upgrade. It really is. I was honestly a little bit skeptical about it at first because I didn't quite see where all the new features were going. But having sat and played with it for a while, I'm a big, big believer in this upgrade. It's more evolution than revolution, but the workflow enhancements are absolutely fantastic. So... We're going to go on a little bit of a sound design journey over the next hour or so. And I'm going to give you a bit of a, a rundown on wavetable synthesis because one of the reasons why I ask about you guys using wavetables is because there is a new wavetable synth within Ableton Live 10. And it is a really, really beautiful and very intuitive user interface. Might not look like it at first, but like anything, if it looks a bit complicated, we just break it down into simpler steps. So, in terms of wavetable synthesis, the whole idea is to take a digitally sampled waveform, in some case, a single cycle of a waveform, and then be able to help that to evolve over a certain period of time using various means. That can be obviously using several waves together. So the wave can evolve and create different harmonics and different dynamics through its travel. And then also through actually utilizing them in combination with one another and also using things like FM synthesis to generate more complex wave shapes. So one of the things I'm, I'm really fascinated by in dance music these days as I was saying to a few people before we got started, is that little space that's emerging in between what I would call progressive house. Like, for those of you under 30, I mean real progressive house, not the progressive house that's happened over the last few years. Thought I'd get that one in early. Basically, it's the, that, that more melodic, emotional style of dance music, the more underground style, and that more sort of aggressive, very big room style of techno, that has become popular in the last couple of years as well. So we're going to go on a bit of a journey where that's concerned. And I threw a little track together just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with and built a preset in the wavetable synth to sort of illustrate how everything can work with this anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play you a a sound, first of all, and I'm going to just figure out where I'm at on here. Dan, there we go.
So just to give you a bit of a taste about what that sounds like. So in terms of what's going on here, let's break the signal flow down into a few sort of discrete steps. Now, you guys obviously using synthesizers in your productions will already know the nominal signal flow of starting with an oscillator, then moving through filters, and then various envelopes and modulations. Now, one of the things I really like about the Wavetable synth in Live 10 is just its overall layout. It's very, very simple. So you can almost work from top to bottom. Also, as well, you have various different views that you can use to your advantage. Say, for example, if I click here, it all nests and folds away into a very easy to read inline synthesizer as you will be accustomed to in live generally. So if we just open that back up, just for obviously using the majority of the screen here, the whole idea is to start with this wavetable and the various different changes in tone that you heard were a combination of changing the actual shape of the wavetable and also what we call the lookup table, which is the exact part of the wavetable that we're referencing at any particular time. So that gives a specific advantage over other synths of other types like a, you know, a regular subtractive synth or even a, an FM synth where we can actually gain much more complex evolution and much more complex tones through the course of working with the sound. So in terms of starting with this, is just picking a couple of very sort of more complex wavetables just to give that richness of tone. And then it becomes about how do we actually start to control it? So we have tuning here in the shape of semitones. So if I just sort of zoom in with the mouse here, you'll see we've got both semitones and also detuning in sense. So we can get some interest in phase relationships going. We can also as well, again, tune utilizing this position here. And again, you can see I've got this set to a macro in terms of the tuning overall. And then obviously we can change the actual position here as well. So we can get a more higher harmonics and then rolling that down. Again, it kind of looks like a Joy Division t-shirt, doesn't it? When you start to break it down. And then obviously using those two wavetables in combination, we obviously then start to get into the more compositional elements. So we'll move on to that shortly. Now, what else is going on here is some filtering. Now, what I'll do is I'll try and bring this up because this is just right in the corner. And one of the things I like to do here is just sort of go through the macros. So for those of you who are big Ableton users, the macros are absolutely essential, especially for a push user like myself. Because anything that I use here in terms of controls will pop up on the actual display of the push which I have with me. So it makes controlling and manipulating the synth much more um, much more you know, natural. It has a bit more of a performed kind of feel. So this actually then feeds into my productions because then I can automate this with a lot of clarity. So again, I'm using just one filter here, but you do have two on board and that can create some very interesting elements, very similar to Serum and Massive, where you can change the relationship and the signal flow between the two filters from serial to parallel. You can even split them into two completely different signal flows if you want, and then recombine them at the end. So, you know, I was kind of playing about with a bit of a band pass, but decided to just run with the general low pass here. And then, obviously, as you saw me here, I could change the tuning of the oscillator by just moving this particular macro. You can see that in the top corner. I can change the amount of frequency modulation that's happening just in the top corner there as well. And I can do the same on this macro for oscillator two as well. Now, anything that I've got color coded in red is pertaining to the wavetable synth. Another important and constituent part of this sound is actually the brand new echo control or the new echo effect in Live 10, which is, to be honest, I personally get worth the upgrade alone. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal delay and actually is, you know, vying for my favorite delay effect at the moment uh, against the, uh, I love H-Delay. Anyone use H-Delay waves? 
phenomenal plugin. Absolutely love it to death. And this, I think, just does amazing things. And I love the visual elements of it. I love the fact that you can obviously set up these left and right a little, you know, a little separated. Say, for example, if I just move this from an 8 to a 16, you actually get a slightly different readout on the Echo itself. So it's a beautiful way of working. The other thing I really like as well is the ability to overload and almost drive the input. And that actually gives you a huge amount of flexibility where you get those really dubby, really spacey, overdriven, quite distorted echo effects that seem to just last forever. And it's great for sound design where that's concerned. And again, the feedback control, very similar to the hate delay where you can go all the way up to 200%. So that's a very, very big part of the sound that I've composed here. So obviously other things I've got to control it, just a little bit of chorus here, nothing too major, just to you know, give it a bit of flavor. An auto filter generally over the whole sound. And this is something I like to talk about quite a lot. And this is not a live 10 specific thing. This is something that I do a lot in live nine as well. I absolutely love the filter circuits in the auto filter. Any of you guys use them at all in Live9? Brilliant. The MS2 is particularly my favorite because it's actually the low pass filter circuit from a Korg MS20. And it really does fatten things up, add a little bit of drive there, really, really does the business. And when I start to go a little bit lunatic with the feedback on the echo, I've then got a limiter there just to make sure it doesn't clip just to you know, save my ears and my equipment and my monitor speakers. Then at the end, just to obviously get into a bit more of a generalized kind of production thing, a little bit of EQ just to round it into the mid-range, a little bit of high pass there. And again, something I'm sure you're very familiar with, a great utilitarian plugin, the Nicky Romero Kickstart. And yeah, that's basically the breakdown of that sound. So what I want to do is, first of all, I actually want to just turn a lot of this off, specifically the echo, so you can actually hear this pretty clean without anything else on. So if I just solo that there. It's quite a, a dry, quite metallic sound. And obviously it's doing quite a lot in terms of the arpeggiator as well. Now, this is uh, another thing I like to talk about quite a lot when I do these masterclasses is obviously the ability to create these kind of arpeggiated sequences. And the traditional workflow is to obviously put your MIDI effects, like your core plugins, your randomizers, your arpeggiators, etc before the instrument. Now, there's a major problem with this where specifically composition is concerned because the only thing that you will get at the end of it is something like this. If I was to just drop this in, I actually don't want that to play, so just pick a note. You'll just get at the end of it this. You'll just get a line. And effectively, your sacrifice a little bit of control over your composition to the arpeggiator. So you're almost a stage removed from what the actual MIDI of that composition is. So I actually don't like to work this way. I've moved away from working this way a long time ago. This is why they're switched off here. So what I actually quite like to do is I actually have a blank MIDI channel and it has no instrument. And its only job is to effectively just fire MIDI out of its output. That's all it does. So why would I do this? Why, this is not gonna make any sound. This doesn't make any sense. Well, if you understand a little bit of rudimentary signal flow, especially around the way Ableton works, you will know that you can actually take MIDI from certain channels and then open the inputs to allow them in. So it's actually quite an interesting setup because let's say for example, if I just stop that clip here, okay. and if I was to say, right, 
I'm going to set the monitor on my wavetable channel to in, MIDI from all in, so that would accept it from whatever I play in, the Porsche or any other MIDI controllers. But I actually want the MIDI to come in from channel two, which is the MIDI effects channel. So this is a, a MIDI effects rack that I've set up that I use a lot of the time. And it has a chord, which is obviously adding complexity. So I can hit one note and it's gonna come out with a four or five note chord here. Then those four or five automatically generated notes are gonna be fed into the arpeggiator. The arpeggiator then is gonna do its business and then it's fed into a MIDI randomizer, which is extremely useful, especially if you're a little bit low on inspiration. You can use this to really add a little bit of, again, as it says, randomness and bring a little bit of unpredictability. And it may well spit out some great musical ideas that you can then capitalize on. But obviously, if you're going to randomize things, you run the risk of things actually moving out of key quite a lot, out of the key that you're working in, which is why the final plugin in this chain is a scale plugin. Now, the scale plugin is there to make sure that in this case, I'm just working very simply in C major. So what this plugin is here to do is make sure that any notes that arrive within the scale plugin will be automatically quantized in real time to the nearest note of that scale. So it allows me to get some really interesting sounds going. Because say, for example, if I was to play a section now with both of these channels armed, what you'll now get is something like this. And absolutely nothing happens. And I can have the hold on on the arpeggiator so I can just hit a note and tweak and free my hands up, which is more important than you'd think. But again, I can just... So I can do that, but also as well, if I was to hit record, and I'm just going to change the click because I've always hated the click on Ableton and you can change it now to different sounds in Live 10, which I'm sure will be a relief to most of you. So. So now, because we've actually changed the position of the arpeggiator in the signal flow, so the arpeggiated notes arrive raw into the channel of the synth that we're playing, it now means we get the raw MIDI in a clip, which now opens our ability out to manipulate, recompose, loop, and completely edit to our heart's content and customize what this kind of vaguely automated system has done. So for me, this is the ultimate way to work with an arpeggiator. This is the way to actually take advantage of what's happening. And again, I've got the fold function on so you can see it's generated a quite wide range of notes. It is a little bit wild, but then my next port of call, if I use the good old Blue Peter, here's one I prepared earlier, what you'll see in this clip is, this is something I prepared last night, and then what you'll actually see here is I'm using a short loop, which is essentially one beat. Because I've identified a little area of just those four notes out of everything that it's generated that I'm really, really interested in. So let's say, for example, we take something like that and we put the monitor back to auto, disarm that, turn that off. And I'm just gonna put a little kick on here from the drum rack of creative and then just play this. <laughs>
see by adding a lot of that in, and that hasn't even rooted anything from the echo yet because it's on 0% dry and wet. So very quickly, just by using the oscillator tuning on oscillator one, if I just move over here so you can see it, you can see that I'm obviously rolling things down from minus 100%, which gives it a more bassy feel. And then more of a lead feel as I tune it up to plus 100%. So if I roll up the entirety of the filter on oscillator one, you'll be able to hear that a lot clearer. one of my macros here which is amp decay just the, uh, the fifth one the first one on the bottom row of macros is controlling the decay of the amp envelope which lets you go from very wild overlapping gated notes all the way over to very very short very sharp arpeggiations again another thing I've got control of here is the ability to use envelope 2 to control filter cutoff and this is very much where the modulation matrix here comes into its own because it's a bit of a grid and you can essentially say I'd like envelope 2 here just to zoom in a touch. I'd like envelope 2 to control filter frequency 1 and this is obviously the amount of control I would like to add. So again, it's very similar to other synths in terms of its modulation capabilities and as you can hear, it's rendering a very sharp, very digital, but a very expressive sound. Now, at this stage, a couple of things to point out. One thing that is adding to this sound and is making it very, very bold is the addition of a sub oscillator, which you can actually control which octave you would like the sine wave to play underneath the combination of the two oscillators here. So at the moment, I've got it two oscillators down because it's just adding a lot of weight. It's adding a lot of beef to the sound. And again, you can control the tone and the gain of that quite easily. The other thing to bear in mind is one of the things that I think Ableton will, and I'm going to qualify this statement right away, I do think in a future update, Ableton will address this. But Wavetable is slightly limited. Now, for those of you who are hardcore power users of Serum, you'll know one of the big advantages of using the synth like Serum is that you can actually load in your own wavetables. Unfortunately, at this time, wavetable in Live 10 doesn't allow you to do that. But again, they're in development with this. It may well be even something they might change before the full release on the 6th of February, although I doubt it. But in a future update, I'm sure they're going to make it completely available that you'll be able to load in your own wavetables. Now, one of the things I do like to do when I do resort to using Serum in tracks is that I do like to use the massive wavetables within Serum. And they are available floating around on the internet. You can find them and you can load them up into Serum. But then the real power with wavetable synths like this and Serum, and again, Ableton's when it allows it to, is loading in your own wavetables. And you can even load in you know, any sort of audio file that will render it into a wavetable and you get some really interesting textures out of it. So, in terms of the, the wavetable synth, you know, we've got a really good overview now of how that tends to work. And from there, I've got another variation on this. So, I've got this kind of arpeggiated thing. We've obviously looked at how to arpeggiate to get the raw audio or the raw MIDI, I should say, and, you know, it's going to be a really useful workflow enhancement for you. Now, another thing I've got here is another wavetable with something I've adapted from one of the presets. And the presets are pretty good, where it's basically a synthetic string pad. 
Now, you'll notice there's a slightly different view here on the wavetable, purely because, and again, you'll see as I've minimized this, you almost get like three views. You get the complete inline view, you get this sort of secondary view where you can quite easily just see your envelopes and modulations in line here. And then as I move further up the screen, it will give you the visualizations of the wavetables themselves. And there are two ways to view the wavetables. So again, you can see here, I'm using two very basic shapes which allow you to move quite smoothly from a sine wave through to pretty much it's almost like a, a, it looks like a sawtooth wave, but it's practically a square wave through a triangle. And again, just using the actual wavetable position here on the push, or in fact, I think it might be on here. Let's have a look, wavetable position. Ah, projector's gone again. Sorry, can somebody sort that out for me, please? Is it? Ah, there you go. Happy days. It's having a little bit of a, an off day today, unfortunately. We're making it work on a Saturday. So wave position, you can see I'm just moving both of these oscillators. And you can see the actual change from, obviously, the limit of the map all the way up to the top end here. So again, you get a really good basic visualization of a wavetable by using this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add in this particular sound. I'm just going to take the send effect away. And you'll be able to hear what I mean here. And again, there's another echo there with the majority of the dry wet over on that. And just some really emotional chords just to make it move in a bit more of a melancholic direction, which a lot of this sort of more aggressive techno, progressive type stuff tends to do. So it's very basic, but sounds great. Add a bit of reverb into here via the send. And again, for those of you who've worked with me before, you'll know that I'm actually a big, big fan of the reverb within Ableton. It just does something that a lot of other reverbs don't do. It's a very diffuse style of reverb it's very unnatural and i almost use it as like a, almost like a synth in its own way where it's almost adding a pad like element to the whole track and again it's great for multi-purpose things like adding drama to say you know drum breaks and things like that as well you know up towards a drop that kind of thing so you'll see i've just got ridiculous settings here like 16 seconds worth of of decay time and again, the whole thing tends to be controlled by and large, although not so much in this case, by, again, a little bit of that side chaining on the reverb itself. So again, that's just adding a bit of width and a bit of scale. And again, you'll be able to see on the top here on Sem B, I'm using another echo with, again, a triplet quarter note just to add a little bit of rhythm to things and to just give things that little bit of extra lift as we're moving through. So again, using the two of them here together in combination. Using the two of these together now, they really do add a, a lot of emotion to matters. This wavetable synth essentially will put you in a ballpark where 
you've got similar sort of sound sets to say the Patrice Barmels of this world, to an extent the Stefan Bodzins, but obviously Stefan's a big Moog user in terms of his synths and bass lines and stuff. Uh, and also, you know, obviously the more sort of ethereal, emotional side of, say, Massio Plex. So it's a phenomenal synth for that. And obviously, the wavetable synths became more prominent with, obviously, the rise of dubstep and those types of sounds, because obviously, you know, Skrillex and a lot of other producers were using techniques like this a long time ago. So it's about showing that these synths are actually much more versatile than just, you know, bro step, basically. Put another slight barb in there, just, you know. I haven't got a problem with passive aggression, honestly. Um, so anyway, moving on to a couple of other elements that I've brought in, in terms of just looking at sound design generally. Uh, drums are always something that I'm asked a lot about. And I'm a massive user of the drum racks. And again, the reason for that is just the actual speed of workflow, the ability to work with the push to very quickly generate clips and grooves, and also as well, just utilizing the workflow of Ableton to its advantage in terms of building quite fully featured drum grooves and being able to, as you can see in a couple of cases here, have sounds available, but not necessarily use them. One of the, the smallest yet most efficient workflow tricks I tend to give to people is never delete a note. Always mute them, deactivate them, because you'll never know later on when you're gonna need them later on in your arrangement. And it's kind of a, you know, a busy fool's charter, so to speak, to delete something and then later have to reprogram it again. So it's just about being efficient and aware of how you work in the moment. So in terms of drum racks, one of the things I like to do, and this sort of spills into a, an overall conversation about not only sound design, but workflow in general, one of the things you'll see a lot of across the tutorials that I work with is that I actually have, I mean, it's not available here, but I have a folder here, which is on my hard drive at home because I couldn't bring my entire studio with me, of course. This is basically a folder of all of my sounds that I designed from scratch. It's in one place. It's synced to a Dropbox. It basically gets backed up to the cloud. I can use it across multiple different machines because I have a laptop that I use as well. And I tend to save absolutely everything in there. And it's amazing the amount of time it saves. So this drum rack has come from, it's modified from a, a previous production, but it, it works like, like a treat. So again, one of the reasons why I love using the drum racks is obviously the speed of everything in terms of the macros and everything else. But also the fact is everything is contained in a group. And again, the ability to do things like this, where effectively this little sub bass kind of hit that I've got is actually a rack that's made up of two separate samplers. And you can do that in drum racks as well. Very, very simple where that's concerned. All you need to do is when you input or import or drag in a sound, if you hold command or control, if you're a PC user, you can drag one sample on top of another and it will automatically generate an instrument rack within that drum rack pad. It's nested within it. So it's a really, really useful thing to do. Because that's one of the things that I hear a lot about people say, oh, I don't use drum racks because I can't layer sounds. And the obvious truth is, is that you actually can. So yeah, you get the ability to do that quite easily there. But again, another one of the reasons why I like to use it in a drum rack situation Obviously, the ability to visualize the entire drum groove in one MIDI clip is very advantageous, although Live 10 does actually overcome that to an extent because now you can actually view multiple MIDI clips in one overlay. So that's really useful for composing. If you're composing a bass line, you want to do a pad over the top of it, you've got the context of seeing the bass line and then being able to see the, the sound you're working with over the top of it. But not only that, one of the things we can try now is that there's a new audio effect here called a drum bus. So if I just add that to the drum rack, you've effectively got here various different controls. And I will wait for that <laughs> projector to potentially pop back up. So just to talk to you about that while it decides to sort itself out is 
the fact that I actually quite use, like one of the little hacks that I've got is I quite like to use an auto filter on a drum rack group. And I like to add that MS2 filter that I was talking about before. And I actually like to add 3 dB of drive. So if we listen to the drums on their own, I mean, you can hear the difference just for the drum rack, just for the drum bus. If I turn the auto filter off, You can obviously hear that subtle lifting and warming of everything, the extra harmonics that it brings. Obviously, the drum bus is slightly more aggressive, shall we say. So if we turn the drum bus on, let's have a little bit of an investigation about this. And it's great because you've got, especially with the soft drive here, you've actually got a lot of room to manoeuvre in terms of being very, very aggressive with adding of the drive there. You've also got these crunch settings. You can damp it down. You can also bring the transient up. And again, there's just little things that I really, really like about this where you can tune, add in a little bit of boom and a little bit of sub bass in just to add maybe, if it was, say, for example, a kick drum, you could add a little bit of sub, low end to things as well, which is quite nice. And obviously, you've got various different drive models, soft, medium, hard. You can apply an automatic com uh, compression to that as well. And obviously, you've got your dry and wet controls here too. So, well worth investigating here. So, let's just listen to some of the... And you hear the crunch is a little bit more mid-range. Pretty ridiculous, right? And it's funny because you get used to the sound after a few bars and you're like, yeah, it's all right. And then you turn it off and go, is that what I was like listening to for the last hour? Shit. Funny, isn't it? So, there's the drum bus. Play around with that. It's wicked. So, with the, the drum sounds themselves, they're just, they're not, it's nothing complicated. And again, people are always a little bit surprised about, you know, what my... Um, workflow is like because it is very very minimal there's not much to it it's just really really good selected sounds and that's where i spend 70 to 80 percent of my time in the studio is just on the selecting of sounds and if i find that if i am reaching for the eq too much or my eq curve doesn't resemble this and it starts to resemble the richter scale then I know it's the wrong sound. I often use the analogy, I'm trying to force a square peg into a round hole. And you can spend and you can waste a lot of time and energy essentially trying to get a sound that you like, which in truth is actually inappropriate for the sound that you're trying to make, for the track that you're trying to create. And that can be a tremendous waste of energy and resources that you could be putting into actually moving the track forward. So again, Having that organizational system is a massive thing. So again, I would encourage you all, Ableton users, Logic users, any DAW that might be in this room, have a folder and a library of sounds that you can go back to over and over again. And it's something that I really do work with with my artists. And if you think about it, there's a little bit of talking about the mentality and the mindset for a minute. There's a real... Um, mindset issue with a lot of producers that are obviously trying to move forward and try and make their way in the game in that you feel like every time you start a track you've got to reinvent the wheel you've got to come out with something that's completely unique and the truth is it's all been done already so just like take that pressure off yourself it's about you expressing yourself in your most complete way it's not about making a point to other people it's not a pissing contest you know it's about getting what's inside of you out and into the reality of the DAW and out of the speakers. That's all it's about, apart from having fun as well. 
So the, the whole reason behind the way I, uh, the, the reason why I'm mentioning this is don't judge yourself if you use the same sounds over and over again because that's what the most successful producers do. The most successful producers have a sound and what is that sound? When you actually, you know, metaphorically nowadays, drop a needle on a record, you instantly know that that artist, their track is playing because you can just tell why. Because it's that kind of kick drum, or it's, he always uses, or she uses that kind of hi hat or that kind of bass sound. So how does that happen apart from using the same sounds over and over again to forge a unique sonic identity for yourself? That's the most important thing. I mean, I love reading articles like anybody does with other artists. And, you know, one of the things I really loved was, uh, you all probably have heard of Sebastian Ledger. Um, one of the things that he said in an interview once is that he's only ever used five kick drums in his whole career. And no one's noticed yet. Which is really funny because he was like, look, if I'm going to make a techno record, I've got a techno kick. I'm going to make a tech house record, I've got a tech house kick. Make a house record, got a house kick. Been using the same kicks for 15 years and no one's asked. So take that little bit of pressure off yourself as well. That's one of the things I'd really sort of say here. And in terms of bringing this together now as a whole, one of the things I really like is um, just little hints of other instruments that just sit in the background that would ordinarily or otherwise be a mainline element. And one of the things that I really love is to use a 303 for things like this. Now, some of you will know that I engineer for a lot of other artists, including some of the names I mentioned before we started. And one of the ones who I regularly collaborate with as an engineer is a guy called Steve Parry, who has, we've had records released on Bedrock, on a number of different labels. And he's obviously known for having a bit of a, a style of acid which is why this preset is called Parry Acid. <laughs> Just to, you know, explain that. So, yeah, he's still not getting any royalties for this if I left this preset out, though. He's not having it. So, one of the things I did do is just mold a preset. And, yeah, again, just using the little internal sequencer within this Acid plugin. And for me, a lot of people talk about audio damage baseline and some of the other 303 emulators for me, the king of the bunch is this, D16 Focion. I've been using it for donkey's years. It's one of the hardest synths to use in the world because it's just weird, but it just does a 303 sound like no other. So in terms of what I've got here, if I actually just start with the basic Focion sound, and I'll take you through my processing here so you'll get a bit of an idea of what I'm up to. So let's just start from nothing. And it's like, oh, that's a bit disappointing, isn't it? Gave it all that build up, and it's like, what that? But if I add a little decapitator here, now we're talking. You've got to respect any plugin with a punish button. Simple. If your plugin has a punish button, I'm buying it, the end. So any plugin developers who need a quick book, just put a punish button. It might not even do anything. I'll still buy it. So Sound Toys Decapitator. Again, you've got to love a plugin called Decapitator. And all it is is very, very low amounts of drive, but with the punish on, just to really, you know, gnarl it up. And it's like three notes. It's just three steps on the step sequence. So that's it. And two of the notes are the same. But you could blow the head off a club with that. Easy. as well and actually one of my favorites to use on this as well is from waves it's the kramer tape which 
A lot of people will use on buses to try and fatten things up because tape machine emulators are great for that. I'm a massive fan of the Slate Digital VTM, the virtual tape machine, during mix down and mastering, which I absolutely love. However, I actually use the Kramer tape less like this these days. I actually use it more like a delay because it's got a real gorgeous analog sound to it. So. Just to give it that little bit of slap back, very, very short. One of the things I really like as well is the fact that there's no note sync. I'm a big fan of plugins that don't have a note sync because then you can play around with it and tune it in order to just add a little tiny bit of groove so you can just knock it slightly off the beat. I think obviously we've played with the echo and we've got note syncs going there. But I do think as producers, we've maybe become a little bit too reliant on note syncs. I think turning the note sync off and actually just, you know, playing around with things until it sounds right in the ears is something that's maybe lost a little bit and we need to bring it back. So again, just adding that little bit of crunch there. And you'll see on this one, I actually use sidechain compression rather than the Nicky Romero kickstart. Now, the difference there for me is that I'm actually aesthetically going for a different sound. I'm not going for the clean reduction of volume as an envelope that the kickstart will give, because that creates a tremendous amount of dynamic range in the mix, because it's almost side-chaining and compressing without compressing, which is a, a great thing. However, in this case, I actually want it to to you know, suck and squeeze and almost like jump out of the speakers and make you feel like it's about to kick your head in. You know, that's kind of the vibe I'm going for with this. And then obviously the eponymous auto filter with a bit of drive, a lot more resonance there. But in this case, I've just added a little EQ8 to really just sweep that away from the low end where the drums and everything else are. Now, one of the things I'll say about the EQ8 is that I always use it by right-clicking and adding the oversampling to get a, a nice, cleaner curve on the EQ. I don't mind the EQ8 for general purpose cuts and filtering like this. I tend to not boost with it too much because, to me, it still sounds a little bit dry and a little bit digital. All of my boosting is always for creative effect in the mix down, and I'll use specific tools like, say, for example, the Slate Digital Plugins, Brainworks, those types of EQs, maybe some Fab Filter Pro Q2 if I'm feeling like really forensic about stuff. That'll be basically all I'll do in terms of boosting. This whole sound is achieved by being fundamentally subtractive as far as the production process goes. And that's another thing to, to think about. The number one thing that I solve with producers who come to me for advice or mentorship or assistance is that it's about confusion of workflow. I see it time and again, people trying to do too many things at once. You're trying to mix the track down while you haven't even figured out what your, 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 your riff is yet. You know, you're trying to do automation and you haven't even finished your arrangement yet. So that's a completely understandable thing because the best thing about DAW technology in the box these days is that you can do anything at any one time. The worst part of DAW technology these days in the box is that you can do anything at any one time. So it's created a confusion of process because, say for example, if I give you the choice of a hundred things to do in the next five minutes, of course, you're going to struggle to make a decision about which one to pick. And even when you do that, you're never going to feel like you've ever made the right decision. So the thing I work on the most is that I try and help people to separate their processes production-wise. So I'm talking about mix-down stuff now, but this is early-stage production. I'm thinking about, I'm not even thinking about the mix-down. That's a totally separate process I do after I've finished producing the track. And I would encourage you all to think about it that way. I would encourage you all to even potentially mix your tracks down in a different DAW to the one that you've created it in to give you that separation of process. But I'm not going to get too much into Mike's territory. I don't want to step on his shoes too much. So, oversampling on the EQ8. I'm bringing this whole thing together. 
we get there. So hopefully you'll hear that in full form being released later on this year when I decide to get off my backside and finish it. So there you go. So hopefully you've taken a lot from that. Now you're a bit more fully prepared for what's to come in Live 10 if you are upgrading. Obviously, as I say, it's still in beta at the moment. Some lovely new touches there. I think it's really well worth the upgrade. And hopefully you've taken a lot on this kind of journey through progressive techno sound design.